Hi everyone, welcome to chapter three on self-concept and perceptions. So today we're gonna really talk about the under to understand the workplace, we really need to understand ourselves better and how that affects the workplace based on our perceptions and how we perceive our coworkers. The big changes for alumni that have taken this class previously with me that I've added a lot more detail on stereotyping, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion practices based on reach recent um, cultural developments and how we can address these issues in the workplace better. There's been some fantastic developments in, in society recently on, these, on this topic, so I wanted to include a lot of that has recently been a, become more available outside of the textbook. So I've added more tools and more descriptions based on these books and some of the items that I've read that will really help you um, advance your perspective on DEI or diversity, equity, inclusion work. So let's get started with chapter three. Uh, the first part of the chapter three in McShane's textbook really talks about the concept of self-identity theory. And that's uh, the theory is we have an identity, our self-beliefs and self-evaluations where they exist at three levels between what we think about ourselves and how we interact with others and how we uh, operate in a collective. And these, uh, the self-identity theory talks about the concept that we make decisions the way we do and why we do certain things based on our identity. And the problem is because we don't necessarily go take a lot of time to understand ourselves and what our identities are, we're unable to explain why we do things the way we do. When it comes to the self-identity theory is that we can also track this by complexity. We have multiple selves and the complexity of our identity is becomes much more difficult or much more complex when we have multiple identities. When it comes to consistency, it's higher when the multiple selves have similar attributes and clarity is higher when we have clear, confidently described stable identities and that tends to increase with age as we get older. So let's just describe this, uh, these, uh, the self identity. So like, for example, I would describe myself as having identity of a motorcyclist, a father, a, a brother, and so and a teacher or professor. And so these identities uh, live within me to define who I am and what I think about myself and why I do the things that I do. The aim of these identities is when we look at the social constructs of ourselves is to have many identities. Um, the research shows that we're subject to less burnout with multiple selves as we tend not to get overly destructive in the workplace by having only a few selves. What I mean by that, it sounds pretty counterproductive, but if you only have one identity, your job, it can become really destructive. Um, if you want to learn more about this, I did a specific uh, management theory video on this around um, how being too passionate in the workplace can kill your career, which will describe this problem of having only one identity in the workplace, like for example, which causes someone to become a workaholic and someone to be so committed to their job that they really can't think of any other perspectives in the workplace. So what I mean by that, it's really important for you guys to always consider that try to develop multiple identities so that you have a healthy balance within your work and your personal life as well. And so when it comes to these identities, uh, they affect our perceptions because who we are tends to affect how we see the world around us and the process that we make sense of this world. The trouble is with when it comes to perceptions that we have a really selective attention and selective attention biases. So, um, and that's the challenge in the workplace, you know, we, and that comes to an example of mental models. We have mental models and how the world works based on our identities that we have of ourselves, you know, and, um, a good example I, I like to share of mental models is that, uh, when I was in uh, working in Ghana, I had this one branch manager, um, and she was uh, in the rural countryside in Ghana. Her branch was made of uh, not concrete, but uh, wood and mud. And when I met with her for the very first time, I saw that all her files were um, on a, basically a wood shelf in, in the branch. 
that contained all the records of all the customers that she had. And I, I looked at her and uh, Cecilia was, uh, Cecilia, uh, so she was a very vibrant lady who was uh, vivacious and outgoing and larger than life. And uh, you know, I really got along with her well. And you know, when I looked at her uh, paperwork and I said to her like, what happens if there's a fire? And she looked at me and leaned in, put her arms on her waist and looked at me and said in a stern voice and said, you know what, Anthony, that's a wonderful question. I don't know, right? And it's an example how uh, mental models are in place where my experience as a banker is that we would normally make sure that any uh, paper records would be completely fire safe. But in her mental models, she didn't even consider that uh, we need to protect these paper files from fire, right? And so that's an example of mental models in place is that they really affect our perceptual biases in the workplace as well. Um, in the videos that you'll see in the slide deck is you'll see a link to the Stanford Prison Experiment, which was a, a study in the early 70s, 1971, by a psychology professor, Philip Zimbardo, who took 24 students, half as guards and half as students, and planned an experiment, experiment for 14 days, but it only lasted six days after an enormous amount of physical and mental abuse of the students that were playing the prisoners. Uh, we saw that in that uh, psychology, psychology experiment, experiment that people fell into their identified roles so quickly that they were actually abusive to others. And it's hard to imagine, but it happens very quickly when we think about how mental models affect us. In the class chapter, you'll see a description of the self-fulfilling prophecy. I think it's one of the most important theories from this chapter. And it describes how managers influence and create their employee behavior. For example, the self-fulfilling prophecy works on a theory that, you know, say if your employee is late you know, on the job and then you brand them as always being late. And so every time they're even a few minutes late, you remind them that they're lazy. You remind them that they're lazy and they're always late. And eventually that gets to them so badly that they actually don't want to go to work and so they end up becoming late all the time because there's they don't want to be in the office and this self-fulfilling prophecy ends up creating an employee that delivers exactly as you imagined this employee would deliver and we'll talk about in class with different techniques to address this problem of the self-fulfilling prophecy which is actually a very common problem that we have with managers that they tend to create the self-fulfilling prophecy with their employees and so they become really destructive with their employees so early that they never have a chance of ever being successful. Uh, the next concept we'll talk about really is really in the class is stereotyping. And why do we stereotype? We do it to make sense of the world and to make it easier for us to understand how the world works. And we, and we also do it to, because it supports our self-enhancement of our self-concept and makes us feel better um, based on our social identity. We categorize people into different groups. We there's a concept of homogeneation, which is assigning similar traits within our own groups and differentiation, which we assign favorable attributes to our own groups and less favorable attributes to other groups. Um, what I'd like to show you now is a, a little image from a Dilbert cartoon, a classic cartoon with Scott Adams, who describes Ben as a classic example of a tall white male with the perfect hair who would make a fantastic leader and is an example of how we see stereotyping effect in the workplace a lot of times. Um, and the next concept that I also want to talk about is fundamental attribution error, which is also a fantastic concept that we should all try to understand. Probably uh, watch the John Bosworth video, who's a licensed health counselor who explains the concept of fundamental attribution error really well in this. And uh, I think it's such an important concept that we do all the time. We make this mist this error all the time. We make this mistake all the time. So it's really good to understand this a little bit better. And lastly, in this chapter, I know this we're going at nine minutes long, but uh, let's talk a little bit about this is uh, diversity, inclusion and equity in the workplace. Now let's describe uh, DEI work. So. Diversity represents the presence of differences in the workplace. So let's describe this as how can we get people to apply with diverse backgrounds uh, to the company. Inclusion is about folks with different identities, feelings or values and feeling welcomed within a given setting. So 
the, how do we get people who are different feeling safe and valued in the organization? So that's inclusion. And the last category is equity. Ensuring everyone has equal access to the same opportunities while realizing the, that advantages and disadvantages exist. And as a result, we don't start at the same place. And that's equity. Now, how do we ensure that people with marginalized identities have a fair shot relative to those that have advantages in the workplace? So that's what we mean by the concepts of diversity, inclusion, and equity in the, in the workplace. Um, the, the textbook is old now because there's so much good perspectives and discussions occurring in society at the moment. And with that, we also talk about BIPOC, which represents a black, indigenous, people of color and emphasizes the discrimination, prejudice, and systemic racism in the workplace that affects these, these groups of employees within the workforce and how we have to identify them clearly. Uh, there's some really good work uh, from D'Angelo in her book, book on white fragility, describing the issue as the fact that as people have not built our racial stamina and that when we use the word uh, racism, or racist in the workplace, it conjures up images of really terrible people from a historical context who have done awful, awful things to people. And so it's really hard to connect with this concept of racism in the workplace because we're unable to imagine accidental racism, you know, stereotypes, you know, biases, implicit biases, which seem relatively harmless in comparison, but do just as much damage. And this popular work by D'Angelo articulates that to be racist, we need to accept the fact that there is a range all the way from extreme racism to accidental race racism. And in many ways, we're being accidentally racist in the workplace. And so we need to build our capacity to see racism in something less serious, which allows us to remove the perceptual errors and apply it in the workplace as, our, as the managers. And we'll talk a lot more about this in the class lecture. Uh, what we're beginning to see in the workplace is to define our workplaces, not the ones that are colorblind, which you know, colorblind is seeing everyone is the same or saying, I don't see color in the workplace. I treat everyone equally, but to more what we want to describe to color celebrate terms, celebrate terms such as where we really appreciate and celebrate differences that people bring to the workplace. Uh, Layla Saad, who also writes this book called Me and White Supremacy, an important concept of allyship and diversity and equity and inclusion activities, talks about, you know, addressing this color blindness in the workplace and listing up these stereotypes, journaling and exploring the lived experiences of others in the workplace. For me, I really feel like until you've lived these experiences, it's hard for you to become an ally, an active supporter, and who's actually building equity in the workplace. And to do this, I believe you have to do a lot of hard work on yourself to understand the lived experiences of others. And there's some great examples throughout history that we see, you know, George R. Orwell's book uh, published in 1933, Down and Out in Paris and London, where he actually lived a life of poverty to realize what people went through so that he could write about it as an example. In the late 18th century, British abolitionists began inspecting slave ships and publicizing the details of these ships and the travel in order to alert the public to the horrific conditions so that they could gain support from their cause. There's an example of the plans of the slave ship Brooks, which you can Google and see. There's 482 captive people on the, on the decks uh, basically stacked like inventory uh, that was exhibited in England in 1789 that shocked so many people to see how people were being treated that it really changed the perspective on the slave uh, trade along with the narrative narratives by enslaved people as well. For me, um, uh, I did a lot of personal work uh, volunteering at Carnegie Center and Gathering Place when I was younger with the homeless community here in Vancouver and the community centers that exist. And to live those experiences and actually meet these people that are homeless on the street, you really start to appreciate them as human beings and people with lived experiences that are going through the same things you and I are. And when you do that, you really start to empathize and understand their perspectives. And I think that's really important is to actually go through that experience of trying to live these experiences with others and live around them so that you can appreciate and understand their perspectives better.
And so let's talk about this concept of uh, implicit bias is also mentioned in the textbook. We talk about many managers want to be more inclusive, but they recognize the value of inclusion and diversity and believe it's the right thing to do, but they don't know how to get it done or they fundamentally believe that they are good people, aren't being racist, but consistently create systemic barriers and implicit biases in the workplace. And that's the big challenge that we have in the workplace. We'll talk a lot more about that in, cl in the class as well. It demands a lot of cognitive energy. So over time, managers tend to go back to their old habits because it takes so much work. For example, after years of recruiting new employees, we kind of develop implicit assumptions on what talent looks like. We have this hidden template in our brains, which uh, identifies what success is in terms of hiring talented people. So let's talk a little bit about the last piece of all of this is how do we fix all these stereotyping and implicit biases and, and racist tendencies or systemic racism that we introduce in the workplace. One is to spend much more time together with your employees. And this is an organizational behavior theory called contact hypothesis, which is by having team members spend more time together, they understand them personally and reduce their biases that they have of them. Working on building your EQ, your emotional intelligence in the workplace is also key. And we'll talk about this during another chapter on how to develop that. So I won't spend any more time right now, but we'll talk definitely about that a lot. Develop your cultural competence by spending more time with uh, cultures that you normally would never deal with. Getting to know them, get, living their lives, spending, deeply, spending time with them deeply, uh, seeing people as individuals, practicing mindfulness so you're thinking about why you're thinking and saying the things that you do out of your, that are coming out of your mouth and uh, Berkeley has some fantastic resources that I'll attach uh, at the bottom of this presentation deck that you can look for resources there and lastly it's using the Johari window which this tool is really around expanding your perspectives and I'll go into greater detail in the class lecture because it'll, it'll take 15 minutes alone and maybe I'll do a separate video on this in class, in, um, in the YouTube video, sorry, as well. So other than that, those are some great uh, tools that you could do to build uh, your, reduce your implicit biases, fix your stereotyping issues, and uh, also increase and improve your mental models in the workplace. So ho help these tools help and uh, helps give you an overview of chapter three. And I can't wait to see you guys in class. See you guys soon. Bye.